Welcome to another episode of The Watchdog with me, Low Key, here on Mint Press, where we, week in, week out, are investigating the structures of power which dominate our society and going against the grain by publishing stories that are often marginalized outside the eyesight and the earshot of the masses. And this week, we are here with a special guest um, who hopefully will be no stranger to our audience. And it seems he has published possibly a seminal text of our time on what exactly happened with the killing of Corbynism in this country. He, like me and many others, saw it as a window to a better world. We saw it as an opportunity to redistribute political, social, and economic power in our society. We saw it as an opportunity to widen political participation. We saw it as the chance of a lifetime. But our hopes were dashed. Mm. They were thrown, scattered into a million pieces and thrown into the wind. We saw people lose their livelihoods. We saw people lose their sanity. We saw people lose their reputations. We saw good people whose aim was only the betterment of their society lose everything they had as part of the killing of Corbynism. People were sacrificed. And Asa Win Stanley, who is our guest today, has been relentlessly chronicling this process in granular detail. You have seen hundreds of vital stories to understanding what happened in this country during that time, published not just by him, but Electronic Intifada, other writers too, tracking bit by bit with true watchdog journalism in, in extensive detail, what exactly was happening in the Labour Party? It was Asa who broke the story that Labour, uh, under Keir Starmer, had employed a former agent of Unit 8200, the um, military intelligence uh, signals communications unit of the Israeli military, which specializes in blackmailing Palestinians on information it has procured through surveillance of them into Labour's office for the purpose of quote unquote social listening. It was Asa mm. that broke that story. It was Asa that broke the story about Ella Rose, who was a former employee of the Israeli embassy and went on to lead the Jewish labor movement. And it was Asa who broke the story about Gary Lubner, the new um, big time funder of the Labour Party, who Asa has in the last week or so revealed to not only be a key Israel lobbyist, but also someone that benefited materially from apartheid South Africa. And now Asa has released this book, which it's essential that we read to understand exactly what happened to all of us and how the hopes and dreams of millions, not only in this country actually, but across the world, trying to find a new way that this political unit that we call Britain can have some type of role in the world which is not destructive and colonial and imperial. And we saw Corbyn as a chance for that. People across the world understood him as somebody who had been anti-colonial in his mindset at key points in his life, and they thought there was a chance for a better world. But all of that was dashed. What happened, Asa? Yeah, that's a big question. I think, I think we still don't fully understand what happened. I, th I think we still don't fully know everything. I have tried to write this book as a first draft, really, a first attempt at writing the history of this. And I mean, they, you know, they say journalism is the first draft of history, and that is what I'm trying to do here. I think that. So many things have happened that we don't know about and that we won't know about probably for decades. I think that the role of the British deep state in combating Jeremy Corbyn 
is not fully known and it won't be known for a while. And, you know, it may never be fully known. We, we can't say for sure. But some of it is known. So some of it was out there. But I think that the role of the Israel lobby was far more blatant. But they worked together. And so I, I think that I did try and I have tried to get across in my new book that aspect, how these different forces of the deep state really work together. So the, the example that I opened the book with was when was when Corbyn was first running. I mean, it's, it sticks in everybody's mind, but it's kind of there were so many things that happened during Corbynism, for want of a better phrase, but I think it's a valid term. The British media went so crazy that it's hard to remember it all. And I've tried to bring it all together in a coherent narrative. But the thing that really sticks out in my mind, one of the things I opened the book with, is the Sunday Times story from 2015, when Corbyn, well, it, was, it was very clear he was going to become the leader of the Labour Party. Um, a serving senior general in the British Army spoke to the Sunday Times. They didn't name him, no doubt. It must have been him. I don't know if any serving senior female generals he said that if Corbyn was to become prime minister there would be effectively a mutiny that was his words there would be rebellions on all levels there'd be effectively a mutiny and why was that well that was because he was somebody who was close to the British peace movement that's what it comes down to he's, he's an anti-war activist and Britain's Britain's imperial role, Britain's role as an empire is over in the sense of running its own empire, but it's now a, a vassal state of the American empire, in effect. And Corbyn is someone who has worked against that in his political life. So him becoming the leader of the country was just something unthinkable to these forces. But I mean, look, even on the British left, we don't know the history of this country, of what, what the British government has done, what the British intelligence services have done, what the British military has done to undermine British democracy. The, the term deep state is used commonly by academics for uh, countries like Turkey and Egypt. Um, and, it, you know, the, the, the term gets kind of a, a bad, it's been kind of devalued in recent years because Donald Trump has used it and people think it's some sort of conspiracy theory. But it's not that. And, you know, Donald Trump occasionally had a point about some of what he was saying because there were elements, no doubt, of the American deep state that didn't like what he was doing. They would have preferred someone more like Joe Biden. On the other hand, Donald Trump did absolutely work to further, ultimately, American empire. There's no doubt about that. Like, you know, when he was saying that we're going to stay in northern Syria to keep the oil and all that kind of stuff, he assassinated um, the uh, Iranian... Uh, military commander and politician, uh, political leader, Qasem Soleimani, who's regarded as a hero by millions in the Middle East for defeating ISIS. Um, anyway, bit of a tangent, but the point is that the British deep state, the, 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 the term deep state is used for countries like Egypt and Turkey because what does it mean? Well, it means the military and the security and intelligence, the spy apparatus, essentially, has a massive amount of influence on how the country is run to say the least. It has a huge amount of influence. In, in Turkey, it's even reached the point where in the past, the military has, has overthrown and had coups against the, against the government. So, um, and similar things happened in Egypt as well. Well, I mean, I mean, also you've got the example of Ramsay MacDonald when he was uh, uh, standing for prime minister yeah. on the Labour ticket. You had the Zenevieve letters that came out, which were supposedly from the head of the Communist Party in um, Russia being sent to Ramsay MacDonald saying, we are very excited for your um, election, we support you, we believe it will lead to a greater relationship between the Soviet Union and Britain. Yeah. And then what comes out after it is that this was a hoax by um, uh, what seemed to be MI5 officers at the time. Yeah. And then you have Harold Wilson. Which, you know, and Harold Wilson wasn't even a Corbyn. He didn't allow British troops to join the US. He wanted Vietnam. to send British troops to Vietnam. Well, 
he, he didn't in the end, thanks to public pressure, partly the Vietnam Solidarity Campaign. That, of course, then led to the spy cops yeah, and the yeah. special demonstration squad and all of that. But, but even but, he was too much for the British deep state. I mean, these are really good examples yeah. of how the fact there is a British deep state yeah. and it is still, it has long, long interfered in preventing democracy, really, in this country. And it's still doing that now. Yeah. It's still absolutely, there's no doubt that it's doing it now. And it was doing it quite openly against Jeremy Corbyn in some regards. Mm. Like just this this story in the Sunday Times was a, just a signal. It was an open signal. It was it was it, it was it was a sign that they would take active measures. And so, you know, if that's what they were doing openly, we can only imagine what they were doing behind closed doors to to um sabotage this popular movement. And I, I think it's so important that we we learn these lessons. And um you know, I, I get into some of that in my book, but I think it's a, it's a far wider project of um, political education and self education that we have to undergo. You know, in this in this country, especially that um, you know, the, the British intelligence services are completely unaccountable. You gave the example of um, Harold Wilson, who was really on the soft left of the Labour Party. Um, he was an imperialist. Really, essentially, he was an appearance responsible very, for Diego Garcia, you know, the was, depopulating of Diego Garcia right. and the handing over of it to the US as a military base. And he was, um, he was very pro Israel as well. But because he had these, you know, moderately social democratic domestic policies, it was not enough for the British deep state. They had they, they worked against him, you know, and there's been some, uh, there's been some really good books about it about the plot against Harold Wilson. There's a book called Smear by uh, Robin Ramsey and uh, his co-author, I forget the co-author. Um, but, you know, these forces, the British British in spy agencies are completely unaccountable to any kind of democratic control and they don't want that power taken away from them. And so they, they work to undermine these kind of popular movements from within because um, you can't, you can't stand up to people power ultim ultimately it can't be defeated but it can't be defeated if there's if it has solidarity you know if it stays yeah. unified if it's divided against itself then it can be defeated and i think that that's what we saw and my book focuses on the israel lobby you know the the subtitle to weaponizing antisemitism in my book is how the israel lobby brought down jeremy corbyn and that's not to say that they were the only factor by any means but what that what the state of Israel and its lobby did was they provided the most powerful political weapon to the British deep state, to the American deep state, to the whole of the political right in this country to work against Corbyn. Everybody, everybody from the right wing of the Labour Party to the Conservative Party to the fascist right is now, has still now has this powerful weapon to say you lot are anti-semitic you lot you a lot are the real racists this is the idea yeah. because they're also <clears throat> devaluing and they're delegitimizing the whole concept of racism you know it's been the, the anti-racist movement has has become so successful that you know popular movements over the decades time and time again the most recent one being black lives matter they've it's become so successful that it is it is a badge of shame rightfully to be racist in this country, but then you can still have the prime minister, the former prime minister of the country, saying openly racist things and not being held account to account for it. And obviously, I'm talking about Boris Johnson, um, and I won't repeat some of the things he said because they're really disgusting. But there was never there was never any accountability for him, and now they're sort of trying to find him guilty of having a party here and there, which I don't think most people care about, to be frank with you. Um, although, you know, obviously there was lockdown going on and, uh, you know, I'm not saying there's no validity to it at all, but in comparison to his other crimes, I would say it's pretty relatively small. Um, anyway, the point is that, you know, I mean, I've heard tell from anti-fascist activists, and I'm sure you've heard the same thing, you know, when they're trying to oppose British fascists these days, like, you know, counter demonstrations against um, anti-immigrant campaigners. And you know, and I don't even want to call them campaigners. Just you know, basically a bunch of fascist rabble outside the hotel, trying to sort of attack uh, refugees and asylum seekers. Um, some of the most desperate people in the world fleeing wars that we've often caused in the first place. The the British government. Um, you know, anti-racist campaigners are trying to 
act against them. And they get the fascists coming back to, to them saying, oh, you lot, you all support, you know, you and Jeremy Corbyn, you're the real racists because you're anti-Semitic. Yeah. Well, they don't even know what it means most of the time. You know, yeah. they don't even understand the concept. They don't know what anti-Semitism is. And they probably, some of them are anti-Semitic themselves. You know, genuinely, actually really anti-Semitic. But this idea of anti-Semitism, most of the time when it's raised in this country, is actually not prejudice against Jews or hatred of Jews as Jews. It is, when it's being raised in this country, it's actually what is meant is opposition to Israel. Yeah. Is opposition to Zionism, the political ideology that dispossessed nearly a million Palestinians yeah. 75 years ago to found the racist state of Israel, the settler colonial entity. Um, and so this is, you know, anti-Semitism is something that's happened historically. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, but today the whole concept has been completely devalued into basically a political weapon to oppose change, to preserve the status quo. So, so what we're talking about is the formation of a trilateral uh, security state, which consists of the US, Israel, and Britain, mm. in which they outsource their problems to each other. So, for instance, your recent piece um, with Kit Clarenberg about the Palestinian Authority, mm. uh, the, the traitorous um, scumbags of the Palestinian Authority who kill Palestinians for yeah. Israel, Mm. Um, that it is basically commanded by figures, former figures of British intelligence who work for the Adam Smith Institute, which has contracts from the British government. So it's like the neoliberalization of spy corps. It's no longer uh, government bodies, it's organizations that are outsourced yeah. by government bodies yeah. with names that kind of obscure what exactly their function mm. is. Now, the interesting thing is you have the establishment of this trilateral state, which acts together mm. in concert. Yes, there is spying on each other. Yeah. Yes, there is competition sometimes. Mm. But generally, there is a complete consensus about what their policy is. The British benefit from the creative ambiguities of acting as the, um, the, the, the troubled conscience <laughs> of, of, of old school imperialists. Yeah, they do, yeah. And they're, they're able to, and it's, it, you know, that kind of leads us onto this question of the Roy Institute study of London in 2011, which I think is absolutely vital for all of us to have a good understanding of, because what it does is it creates a designation of pro-Palestinian activists and actors in London specifically, but in the country yeah. as a whole. Now, it designates critics on one hand of Israel and delegitimizers of Israel. Now. This is a room which contains solely delegitimizers, <laughs> certainly. And, 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 you know, the, the influence of the Roy Institute is important. It's huge. Because when you even look at that study, particularly who is thanked yeah. in assisting in the production of that study. Yeah, so Jer 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 Jeremy Bowman. Jeremy Bowen. Is it Bowen or Bowen? Uh, Bowen, yeah. Bowen from the BBC. Yeah is thanked. Yeah. So he contributed Middle East correspondent for the BBC yeah. contributed to the Roy Institute's um, study, which was his it they was interviewed it, a vast number of people, yeah. But but it took place though under the auspices of Israeli intelligence, basically this yeah, study. Yeah, this is now, a this is a you know ostensibly a, a non governmental think tank, but it, it, it's a cutout for the Israeli and, state. And and it says in it that we thank this particular figure from these government. It's very clear. It's close ministries. to Israeli intelligence and ministries. And and funded by the same people that funded the same organisations that killed Corbynism. Yeah. Now. Those designations exist for us mm. and they determine the type of policy which is aimed at us. Mm. So the delegitimizers are said to receive attack and sabotage wherever yeah. possible. Yeah. 
the critics now, now, now this is where we go in an interesting direction because we, the, the publicly aggressive lobby groups stood up and identified themselves. And this is one of, I think, the greatest failures of that period of time is that appeasement became a knee-jerk, instinctive response yeah, by people who should point. know better. Yeah. Right? Now, it wasn't even thought about. It was just done. Yeah. Yes. So attack and sabotage is aimed at delegitimizers. Yeah. But critics are subject to sophisticated engagement strategies. Yeah, these are, you're quoting according. it. This is the exact word. So. Uh, sophisticated engagement strategies. So then, surely for us, our job is to actually analyze what are the sophisticated engagement strategies yeah. that are targeted at the critics? Because what they say is they want to draw a wedge between the critics and the delegitimizers, yeah. separate them. Yeah. And this is basically what happened with Labour. Labour was told, be a critic, rely on international law, don't mention Zionism, talk about a two-state solution, embrace the Palestinian Authority. That is the pro-Palestinianism which is allowed in this country. Yeah. The delegitimizers read Electronic Intifada, mm. donate to mm. Palestine Action, and listen to my music. Mm. This is the wedge that was drawn. The, the critics are allowed to have membership of uh, unions like uh, GMB or even receive funding from unions like GMB. Yeah. So then the question here is, understanding that there's this designation that has been applied to all of us. Mm. What happened next? Uh, I think the sophisticated engagement strategies were the Jewish labor movement. And it, uh, uh, primarily, primarily the Jewish labor movement. The Labour Friends of Israel as well, to a lesser extent, but I don't think that was particularly sophisticated because it was, I mean, look, they, you know, it, I think it was very clear who they were. Um, even though you weren't allowed to say they're a front group for the Israeli embassy, they blatantly were, and they were caught on camera by Al Jazeera saying that, essentially. Um, Michael Rubin, uh, who is now the full-time director of Labour Friends of Israel, was caught on camera by Al Jazeera saying that we, Joan, Joan Ryan, then the main MP leading Labour Friends of Israel, will talk to shy most days, Shai Masot being ostensibly the representative of the Israeli embassy, but was actually a, essentially an Israeli intelligence agent for the Ministry of Strategic Affairs. So you have Labour Friends of Israel, its main MP, its leading MP, taking direction, essentially, most days from the Israeli embassy. Absolutely no doubt it's still doing the same thing now. It's a cutout for the Israeli embassy. And I think most people, you know, even on the left of the Labour Party, such as it is, would, at least privately, they'd probably concede, yeah, it's close to the Israeli embassy. But when it comes, the Jewish labor movement was more sophisticated because in the sense of it was able to create more of an effective wedge because they, then you've got people with uh, political opportunists, no doubt, but people with a massive platform, and I'm talking about Owen Jones, especially, who has a, who has a mainstream massive mainstream platform. He's, he's on the uh, mainstream news all the time. He is the acceptable voice of the British left. Um, he is who the mainstream media says is, is the acceptable extreme of the left. Um, and he was, he was engaged. He was engaged with this sophisticated engagement and he was able to say, well, I support the Palestinians. I oppose the settlements. Um, but I'm against all this anti-Semitism and Ken Livingston should be expelled from the Labour Party. Jackie for Walker, stating historical fact. For stating historical fact about Nazi, uh, Nazi Zionist collaboration in the 1930s. Which has been extensively covered yeah. by, in Hebrew, in English. There's even, for example, on this issue of Nazi collaboration with the Israelis, there's been um, dramatizations and series made about it in Hebrew. Yeah, it's a fact. It, it happened. And, you know, still nowadays, the Israeli state collaborates with far right groups. It, it, it absolutely happens. And if you look at the discourse between Jabotinsky and Ben Gurion during that time, Ben Gurion is referring to Jabotinsky's guys as brown shirts. Yeah. 
uh, Jabotinsky's calling Ben Gurion a little Hitler. Yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> today, you have Israeli political analysts and even members of the Knesset calling Netanyahu and Ben Gavir Nazis. Yeah. This discourse is completely permissible for some people. Yeah. But to speak in these terms, we are dancing all over yeah. the IHRA. Yeah. No, it's just a fact, you know. I mean, uh, you know, our friend David Miller, I, he, you know, one of the world's foremost experts in the Israel lobby, I would say, certainly, you know, certainly in this country. Um, he, you know, fired from his job at Bristol University because he's an anti-Zionist, even though he was found completely innocent of anti-Semitism by independent investigations. He said the other day, uh, at a talk he did the other day, he said something along the lines of, I don't know any other way than to speak the truth. And you know, yeah, I identify with that because I think it you have to speak the truth. And this is what happened. It's a fact that there's no point in not talking about it. Like what it tells us something, the fact it's really interesting, you know, you make you made a really good point about actually both main sign factions of the Zionist movement, the state of Israel now, um, they both sort of called each other fascists. That's interesting, you know, both sides, but the, the ostensible Zionist left and the ostensible Zionist right. And they were kind of both right because they those <laughs> those 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 links did exist, you yeah. know. The the right wing Zionists, the Lichai and the Irgun, the, the Lichai infamously actually reached out to the Nazi government yeah. to try and offer to strike an alliance, a formal alliance. In 1941. Yeah, during the Second World War. And, and, and said, we'll go along well, with the Madagascar plan. The Holocaust. We'll fight on the German side in World War II. Yeah, they offered that. Um, you know, the Egun was... It's a historical fact. Argue with history. I mean, argue with the books that have yeah, been written about it. It's not there. us saying this. It's, the and, document is there. And... Um, and you know the the ostensible Zionist left actually did a lot more than offer to. They actually collaborated with um, they actually collaborated with the Nazis. So the yeah. the German. I mean, I have a whole chapter about it in my book, so people can read all the details there. But um, uh, and also there was the whole instance which I, we won't have time to get into, but of um, the Hungarian Zionist leader yeah. who really collaborated with um, with the Holocaust. And Israel Katzner. Yeah. You know, this was a famous case yeah. in, in Israeli history. This was somebody who was very close to Ben Gurion, and many perceive, many perceive that his libel case that he launched against um, uh, a gentleman who had been. Who, <laughs> Someone from I the Zionist know, right, I don't know if I, if I actually remember wrongly, but I think the person that was handing out leaflets talking about his collaboration with the Nazis, mm. this is Israel Katzner, I think his second name was Greenstein. <laughs> but I might uh, be wrong. I forget okay. his name. I might be wrong. Like but he, so what happens is Israel Katzner is a high profile figure in the Israeli Labour Party. Um, and he ends up trying to sue someone, accusing him of collaborating with Eichmann and the Nazis. Yeah. And it goes into court and it becomes very apparent that actually he did. Yeah. And, and it, the interesting thing about that is that... He uh, did it at the behest of the leadership of the Zionist yeah. movement at the time. Rezo, Rezo Katzner, um, also known as Israel Katzner, he... He didn't want to sue, but he was forced to by the leadership of the <laughs> Labour Zionists because it was embarrassing for them. Long and story short, the guy ended up being assassinated by by the Shin Bet. And the documents have been sealed for yeah. almost a hundred years. The documents have, have been sealed and um they are yeah, they're unlikely to ever be opened up until Palestine's liberated if they still exist, you know. Yeah. Um at that point. But they um yeah, so you know, this guy became an embarrassment, and he was off, and um, because there was this big libel trial, and um, it's just a fact. Yeah, it's just a fact. You know, and it's Ken Livingston mentioning it, how whatever your opinion is of of the way a person says something, 
that's yeah, neither here nor talking, there. It's historical exactly. fact. It's and historical also, fact. like we're talking. Okay, let's just say for the sake of argument, I don't agree, but just say for the sake of argument, what Kevin Lewisom said was undiplomatic. Because I've had some people sort of argue that. Okay, it doesn't matter. Okay, it was it undiplomatic. Doesn't matter. What are you saying? You should have been was expelled it wrong? from the Labour was it Party wrong? for for being was undiplomatic. It wrong? No, you know, we need a little a little less yeah. diplomacy and a bit more fire. I yeah, think. yeah. And, and and the thing was is they were able to. Um, Un, un dehumanize him, stigmatize him, demonize him. You know, this yeah. someone who was a a kind of an iconic figure of the Labour Party, historically mayor of London, you know, um, and they they threw him to the wolves. And so really the writing was on the wall yeah. from that point that yeah. others would be sacrificed in the yeah. same way. Yeah, this is this is it because this was the problem, like, so they were attacking Jeremy Corbyn straight away. From the summer of 2015, they were attacking him on this issue straight away. They were accusing him of anti-Semitism, saying he was an extremist, yada, 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 on and on and on. At first, and this is what I try and trace the lines of in my book, because it would be impossible to, 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 to recount every single instance of, of, of this. I tried to It was a factory. It was a factory. It was a smear factory. Yeah, it really was, and I, I, it was, it was impossible to keep up with it all. And in a way, you, you don't want to just debunk everything. You want to stop things from happening in the first place. But what I tried to show in the book, and I think I've succeeded in doing, is it started off attacking Jeremy Corbyn personally. He's a racist. He's an extremist. Blah 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 blah. It didn't fully take off at first. And the reason being, Jeremy Corbyn is not a racist. He's not an anti-Semite, and people could see through it. And a lot of these things were debunked. And straight away, they were attacking him on saying, well, you know, oh, they were implying he was anti-Semitic. They were sort of trying to imply it and say, oh, well, you know, you, you called Hamas your friends and all this kind of things. Well, you know, Hamas is, whatever you think of it, is a popular Palestinian political party. And more importantly, it is the leader of the armed resistance, which Palestinians support. Whether yeah. people like that or not is irrelevant. It's it's not anti-Semitism. And is a right of all occupied people, according to multiple UN resolutions um, and democratically elected government. Exactly. This is it. So it was, it was, um, it didn't, it, it was sort of rolling on in the background and it was an irritant and annoyance and it made things difficult. But it didn't start to explode really until they, they decided, okay, that's not working. We'll try to stub the same thing but slightly differently. We'll go for the people around Corbyn. Yeah. We'll go for the people around Corbyn. So even before Ken Livingstone, it was this event, which a lot of people forget, but was I think was really important, was um, what happened at Oxford University Labour Club. So I, I have a, a whole chapter, well, two chapters really, about what happened here in my book, and people can read all the details there. But in a nutshell... Oxford University Labour Club, there was an allegation and it became a big national story um, and it even had international dimensions. There was a, a columnist, a, a prominent com columnist in the New York Times who, who wrote a, a column about it, um, about ooh, an anti-Semitism of the left. And the story in the national press was the leader or the co-chair of the Oxford University Labour Club you know, student is a fancy name for a student society, Labour Party student society, had quit his position because of anti-Semitism. There's a mm. terrible, anti you know, they in, they announced investigation. Um, Ed Miliband, the former leader of the Labour Party, cancelled a, a planned speaking event at Oxford University Labour Club. It was it was on all these headlines. It was a terrible scandal. Um, but there was no basis to it. There was no evidence. There was no. You know, no one asked any questions about it. You know, there was no evidence. Like, and so when the when the guy, his name was Alex, young guy, name of Alex Chalmers, he posted uh, a, his resignation statement on Facebook about it. Uh, you know, I've I've quote from it in my book. I've still got the screenshots now, although it's deleted. What he actually said was, "I've resigned." Yes, he accused people of anti-Semitism, but there was nothing specific. There was no specific allegations, except what he said was, oh, they voted in favor of Israel Apartheid Week. Yeah. So, you know, the Labour Club is deciding that it's going to campaign for Palestinian equality 
and raise awareness of Israeli apartheid. But instead of being able to do that, he's ignited this big national scandal over a completely manufactured and invented idea of anti-Semitism in the yeah. Labour Party. And this was really, really important, not just for that one, that one story, which was just one of many stories, but it really started for, for two main reasons. It started this trend of um, people around Jeremy Corbyn being attacked and it spread it. So it spread it to the wider movement. And that meant that, you know, obviously the people, Corbyn and his people were going to protect Corbyn. But then if there was, you know, some pro-Corbyn student at the lab at, at Labour, are they really, are they going to protect him? Probably mm. not. They probably might consider him expendable. And um, so people started, people around Corbyn started to be picked off one by one by one by one. And that was ultimately, in the end, years later, a few years later, led to the political assassination of Jeremy Corbyn himself and the decapitation of the movement. It was a war of attrition. It was a war of attrition, absolutely. And, um, you know, you have to hand it to the enemy, to the Israel and its lobby. They, 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 they did that successfully. You know, they, did, they didn't give it up. You know, even in the Al Jazeera documentary, the undercover Al Jazeera documentary, which exposed this Israeli, uh, eff effectively an Israeli intelligence agent, yeah. an Israeli spy, Shai Massot, um, he said it. He said, don't let it go. When yeah. he was asked for advice about Jackie Walker, who was one of these pro-Corbyn people picked up, yeah. picked off. Don't let it go. Just keep keep on and on and on and on. And yeah. they, did, they did do that. So the second reason why that was important uh, in the smear campaign was because what it started was the first investigation, the first of many, many investigations into so-called anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. I lost, uh, you know, I, I count them up in my book. I believe it's about six or seven different investigations. Yeah. And that was the first one. It was the Labour students' investigation. It was yeah. never published. It was never officially endorsed. It was kind of hushed up, but I did manage to obtain it. Yeah. I didn't publish it. I published some extracts from it. I didn't publish it because it was a completely libelous document. Yeah. It just made, there was stuff in it that I managed to show was completely made up. So I have a question here now. And sorry, one more thing on yeah. that. The guy who wrote it was then soon after given a job in Labour Friends of Israel. There you and go. he worked and he admitted to working closely with Shai Massot. There you go. So 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 now now give us Asa um where because what people will say we do is we assume a lack of agency. So they say, okay, these groups might be pro-Israel, yeah. but they personally feel aggrieved by what they deem to be anti-Semitism. They say to us, where's your proof this is being directed by the political unit, yeah. the alleged state of Israel? What? Okay. Wait, 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 break, break down for us where that, issue of direction comes into it because there's things that can, you know I'm, I'm happy to play wingman on this answer but i'd love to hear you break down what first, i mate. would say to that right is i'm sure cia agents feel personally aggrieved that mm. whatever justification comes in their mind that american freedom is being yeah, yeah. crushed in in but, venezuela but specifically in this case that break it down for us <laughs> so um yeah, I mean, what I would say is, yeah, of course, the people in these groups, they probably believe a lot of what they say. Yeah. I think I don't think they believe everything they say. Well, I mean, in a way, you just gave me an example with Shai Massoud, and he's talking about don't ever drop it. This is a directive given by an Israeli government official. So, yeah. I mean, but yeah. But it's <laughs> it's like, it's they work together. And these, these groups, these pro-Israel groups, so this whole idea of, oh, oh, you know, you're taking away their agency. I just think it's a load of rubbish because they, it is proven and shown that they act in close coordination with, like, that's the whole point. Why would you have a pro Israel group if it's not going to work closely with the state of Israel? You, you know, one of the pictures that I love is, or at least picture, try to, yeah, 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 is the picture that you at Electronic Interfather published of Ella Rose next to. Um, in front of David Cameron, next yeah. to Israeli embassy personnel, probably the Israeli ambassador, I think, at the time. I think that when was... she worked there, you know who else was in the picture? The convicted fraudster Gerald Ronson. Right. Yeah. Right? yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, so, 
there's a united front being shown here of Israeli embassy employees as well as the head of the CST. I, the, think, the... I think that photo was actually the heads of the different Israel lobby groups. Right. CST, Board of Deputies, uh, JLC and so forth. There was another right. picture where she was posing with um, uh, the former ambassador and with Jeremy Newmark. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but, th I mean, that in itself tells you something, that these groups are so intermingled. Yeah, yeah. they act They're in so, concert. They literally have revolving doors between them. So she's gone... She worked in the Israeli embassy and she's gone straight from the Israeli embassy to the Jewish yeah. labor movement. And, and, and tell us about the Board of Deputies Trustees Report 2020. Yeah, so the, the Board of Deputies is... Um, Board of Deputies of British Jews. It's a very old organization. You know, it's... Um, you know, it started in the 18th century, I believe. Um, but right up until the 1940s, it was anti-Zionist. Um, but... In the 1940s, it was there was essentially a hostile takeover by the Zionist movement, and I think this is something we don't know enough about actually. And if you read uh, Paul Kellerman's book, which I relied on for some quite extensively actually for my book, uh, you know, brilliant um, Manchester University academic, he wrote a definitive study of um, the British left and Zionism, his subtitle "History of a Divorce." It's a really good book. It's, it's really readable. You know, there's a lot of academics who um, are frankly terrible writers. Mm. He's not one of them. He's a good writer as well as being a, a good researcher. Um, and um, in that, he explains, and this has been explained by other, um, by some, you know, anti-Zionist uh, academics and so forth, of the concept of um, in Zionism, of the conquests of Zionism. And um, the way Paul Kellerman explains is there was there was three conquests central to the success of Zionism. Number one was the conquest of labor. Number two was a conquest of land. And number three was a conquest of community, of, of a conquest of communities, um, which is a little bit more complex. And we'll come to the first one. The complex of labor was essentially. Um, uh, replacing Palestine, coming to Palestine, colonizing yeah. Palestine, and getting rid of Palestinian workers. And that's where not, you get the not relying on Palestinian yeah to till the soil. Zionism, yeah, getting rid of the Palestinian workers, replacing them with Jewish workers, Jewish yeah, colonists. Yeah. Number two, conquest of the land, physical conquest of the land. Yeah. Number three was the conquest of communities. Now that's more complex because the first two are, are more about Palestine. Number three is the conquest. Of, what what is meant by conquest of communities is the conquest of Jewish communities. Yeah, yeah. In Europe, and, and in and, and in Iraq, and in around the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what was meant by that was taking over the institutions. Yeah, yeah. The institution institutional bodies of world Jewry, Jewry and conquering them for Zionism, and that was, you know, to a large extent outside of um, uh, religious ultra orthodox communities. And um, outside of um, you know secular left wing anti Zionists, that was that was done to a very large extent. And so, this is a long way to go about saying that the Board of Deputies of British Jews essentially claims to represent all Jews, but is actually really, um, in large part, an Israel lobby organisation. That's what it spends most of its time doing. And the document that you mention spells that out. It says we have a quote close working relationship with the Embassy of Israel including the Israeli military spokesman uh, and the Ministry of Strategic Affairs, which is essentially an Israel. Well, it's now been uh, supposedly disbanded, but in reality folded into other ministries. But it was really a semi-covert Israeli sabotage agency precisely for this kind of way to institute to uh, advise stuff that you mentioned since 2009 and a series of reports by the Rate, Rate Institute starting in around about 2009, 2010, 2011, the, the, the recommended strategy was, quote, as you said, sabotage and attack hubs of what they call delegitimization uh, in the West, and they especially focused on London um, uh, and other, you know, what they regarded as hubs of delegitimization. Palestine solidarity, centers of Palestine solidarity around the world. I mean, it's interesting you mentioned the conquest of communities. There's an amazing book by Abbas Shibla um, called um, The Law of Zion. And it's 
looks in, in intense detail at the campaign in Iraq to get what was referred to as Zionist emissary by Zionist emissaries at that time as good human material. Mm. So the Iraqi Jewish community, um, ancient community, um, had attained a certain level of not only political but economic power in Iraq throughout the British uh, mandate of Mesopotamia, a former fin finance minister, prominent member of the Iraqi Jewish community, um, to aid in what Yusuf al-Kabir, who was an Iraqi Jewish lawyer in the 30s, their militant archaeology. That's what he called Zionism, a form of militant archaeology. And that campaign is fascinating because not only does it um, involve the provision of key um, social assistance that one might imagine, it even ends up in seemingly, in, in Shiblach's book, he 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 makes the claim that both the British embassy, the US embassy, and the Iraqi government had a consensus that the 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 the, the bombing of synagogues in Iraq, including cafes that were frequented by Jewish people, had taken place by um, Israeli intelligence in 1951. Because they'd been able to pass something called the the denaturalization law. So they had Tawfiq Aswadi, somebody who they'd been cultivating at least since the 20s and 30s. So at one point, they, Tawfiq Aswadi was an Iraqi political figure who went on to be prime minister in 1951. Now, he was somebody who had shown a willingness to um, carry out a population transfer this was back in the 20s and the 30s, whereby Iraqi Jews would be sent to Palestine and Palestinians would be taken into Iraq. Yeah, it was a absorbed. long standing plan of Zionism was to expel Population Palestinians to Iraq. Yeah. yeah. And so what he then did in 51 was he passed this law which would allow Iraqi Jews to leave their Iraqi citizenship, give up their property um, and anything they owned, and become Israelis. Right now, what Abbas Shiblak does in this uh, book is he tracks the exact figures of people month by month that took up this offer, and so he looks at the first three months when the denaturalization law was passed. Mm. And it's very small uptake. Yeah, you know, from the centers like Basra and Baghdad, which had ancient. Why and, and would they go to? Why would they? <laughs> The state had been at war with. But the state had been at war with. You know, the the the, the period of forty eight and the war with, you know, the governmental and monarchy um, betrayal in some ways had been popular. You know, the 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 Iraq's participation in the war in Palestine mm. was widely supported in yeah, yeah. Iraqi society. Legislation had been passed, you know, despite the fact that the government, um, like I say, had uh, had ultimately fallen in line with the Hashemite mm. position, yeah. which was to facilitate Israel, basically. Yeah. Um, they had passed legislation against uh, Zionism in the society in general. However, um, the interesting thing is that whether it was the third or the fourth month, I can't remember exactly, but it was the month when the turning point happened, these bombings took place. Then people leave, hundred over 100,000 people leave. Um, but then when they get to Palestine, they find themselves into, and there's an amazing uh, documentary about it, Insa Baghdad, um, which speaks to some of these people that had taken this journey. And they say that when we got to Palestine, we were left in camps, yeah, and the Israelis sprayed us with DDT when we got off the plane, and we had to, um, you know. And then this goes into the stratification within Israeli society yeah, on, on racial was lines. Racism against, Zionism was racist against, um, you know, against Jews as well. Jews yeah. who were from Arab countries, and, 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 they considered them to be. Subhuman, basically. And Ellen uh, Shahat sort of uh, posits these people as Arab uh, victims of Jewish victims of Zionism, mm -hmm. Arab Jewish victims of Zionism. But, you know, obviously, we do know that uh, there's a heavy, heavy 
uh, contingent supporting the, the most right-wing Zionist policies within these communities now of what they call the Mizrahim. But, you know, at that particular time, this was a group of people viewed as useful human material. But it's just really interesting the way that that conquest of communities manifested in different contexts. You yeah. had the situation in Egypt, for example, um, uh, Levon, yeah. the Israeli minister of defense. Now, this is an interesting one. because It's not like Iraq. The Israeli government take credit for it. So yeah. during Abdel Nasser's time, yeah. you have bombs placed at uh, positions of U.S. importance, but also positions of Jewish importance in Egypt by Israeli intelligence, to yeah. the extent that Levon even got an award by the Israeli government for this this operation. Yeah, it, that it, the, it's called the Levon affair in Israel because it. I forget it all came out, you know, in. Israel, like some years later, and there was some scandal over it. But it wasn't the fact that the Israeli state had carried out this massive terror operation against primarily Jewish targets Egyptians, yeah. in Egypt um, as a false flag um, in order to uh, uh, basically provoke war with Egypt. Um, it, I forget what the, that wasn't the scandal. The scandal was some relatively minor political thing. I forget all the details of it now, but it was just that they, had, they hadn't done it effectively enough or something like that. But that all came out and that was all proven. But it's still now not really considered to be uh, much of a problem. You know, it's kind of a forgotten bit of history. The, uh, the Iraqi, I mean, the, the, the Jewish community in Egypt was relatively small, I think, but the Iraqi Jewish community was, was fairly large and it was, <clears throat> It was very ancient as well, you know. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think that is a, a massive... I mean, I personally have no doubt whatsoever that um, Mossad was behind those bombings of synagogues and, and um, um, other Jewish community areas in Iraq. I, you know, it they absolutely drove all that. Um, I think it, it... I saw an interview with the, um, the academic, Kavi Schleim, who's a really interesting... Um, He's a really interesting and impressive historian who, um, you know, he uh, he's often described as uh, Israeli. I would, uh, my, to me, he's an Iraqi. He's an Iraqi Jew. That's it. Um, um, he's he's an interesting character because I think he's kind of moved more anti-Zionist over the years. But anyway, that's as may be. But the point is, he his background is from Iraq. I think he might have even been born in Iraq. Certainly, his parents were. Yeah. Um, and. Um, he did an interview some years ago um, with Azam Tamimi, and he asked him about these incidents. Yeah, and his he, he and he said, you know, what have you found anything in the archives about this? And he said, well, I did check the Israeli archives, but I couldn't find any concrete evidence of this. But he said, every single member of my family believes that was done by the Mossad. Yeah. So that is widely known, and you know. That is widely known within those communities. I mean, and so it's we, interesting. What I think that is something that will probably come out in the future. And then with the Yemeni community, this is the other thing. You the know, children, children were kidnapped, literally yeah. kidnapped by by um, white Jewish yeah. families. Yes, by the state. Yes, by the by the Israeli and, state. And the and parents were shown families. were shown graves. To so understand, we're talking about Yemeni Jewish population. That is another by hook ancient, or by crook. Yeah. Another ancient population by mm -hmm. hook or by crook is lured into Israel. The children were kidnapped from these yeah. Yemeni families. It's a, again, it's another scandal in, at birth. in Israel, which is not talked about in the West. And the Yemeni families were told, your children died in birth and were shown graves. The children who were not dead and who had been kidnapped and taken into Ashkenazi you know, I mean, this is white supremacy. What do what do you want to call it? It's white supremacy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know what I'm sort of partly interested in as well. When you were talking about the far right aspect, is you know we can't forget that Tommy Robinson, he was a Shilman fellow at the you know because the the far right were also making uh, leaps and bounds during this time. You know, until Tommy Robinson was taken off of social media. Mm. He was reaching millions of people daily through social media. Yeah. Now, I'm not, I'm not one of these people that sort of gets the state to then shut down people whose opinions I don't agree with. Mm. But when you look at also his funding and you understand, that, okay, he was a Shilman fellow at the David Horowitz Freedom Center. Okay, yeah. David Horowitz, well-known Israel lobbyist. 
That's a fact. Robert Shillman, though, was on the board of the Friends of the IDF at the same time as he was given, according to Lucy Brown, £10,000 uh, or dollars a month to Tommy Robinson yeah. um, as a Shillman Fellow, which was a position also shared by Ben Shapiro. Tommy Robinson then goes through his court situation. Who pays his legal fees? The Middle East Forum. Who leads the Middle East Forum? Greg Roman, who's a former employee of the Israeli Ministry of Defense and the Israeli Foreign Ministry. So in a way, there's direct role of people involved with the mechanics of the Israeli state pushing Tommy Robinson and his ideas in British society. You look at Katie Hopkins. In a way, there was a bit of a split here because at one point the Board of Deputies um, you know, issued statements against Katie Hopkins, but Katie Hopkins received a huge amount of support inside occupied Jerusalem by the Israeli mayor of Jerusalem, who's now gone on to a higher government position under the Netanyahu government. Um, and Katie Hopkins was also supported by David Horowitz Freedom mm -hmm. Center. So in a way, you've got, you know, when we were talking earlier about racism, it's like we have had an explicitly Islamophobic foreign policy as long as I've been alive. Mm. There's been people that I consider myself to have an affinity with on the other side of British government and US government and Israeli government, which is the trilateral security state which uh, lurches over us, on the bottom of those bombs. Mm. So this is state-sanctioned racism that is just the norm. And yet at the same time, we're seeing an opportunity for us to, to, to widen political participation and decision-making in the society, and we're the ones called the racists, when yeah. we've been working all these years against the racism which has hurt us and hurt our families. Yeah. Yeah, this is where we reached her, and this is, why it, this is why it was such a powerful weapon, because it really got, it really got to people. And, you know, people sometimes say to me, well, was it all the Israel lobby? Wasn't it Brexit? I'm not saying it was all the Israel lobby. That's not the point. The point is that it, this was the most damaging weapon that was used against this popular movement in a way that Brexit wasn't. And because to be, you know, okay, people have different, you know, opinions over Brexit. At the end of the day, so what? The point is Jeremy Corbyn was being attacked, personally attacked as something that actually got to his heart, which was, oh, you're racist. You know, and I think he probably started to believe not that he was racist, but, oh, maybe there's something in all this and maybe I need to do something about it. And this was the problem. You know, this was the real problem. So because they, they, they were beating a, a delegitimizer into a critic. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think, uh, I think that was, that was the project. Absolutely. You know, mm -hmm. and, um, uh, it was it was incredibly damaging because ultimately it was it was divide and rule and it was like you said it was what they called what the Railroad Institute called the the wedge strategy yeah because they know this is why sabotage and attack was so important for them it wasn't um, winning hearts and minds no no <laughs> but but that's also because they knew they can't and and they've also always, you know the Zionist movement has always been top heavy. Yeah. It's always been top heavy because it's never been massively successful yeah. in an organic grassroots way. Yeah. It has always had this to This is use why Labour Friends of Israel above. doesn't have a membership. Yeah. If you look people people informally say, Oh, they're a member of Labour Friends of Israel. If you go onto Labour Friends of Israel website and you try to join as a member, you can't. There's no right. membership form. Yeah. Because they they in the past they did have members mm. decades ago. But I, again, this is something Paul Kellerman talks about. They had to wrap it up because they, they didn't have enough people supporting them. Yeah. Instead, they get supporters. Who are the supporters? They're MPs, they're lords. You know, yeah. they're these prominent figures within the Labour Party. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's um it shows they don't have they don't they don't have the people on their side, they don't have any kind of mass movement. All they have is lobbying, yeah. money and delegitimization and just dirty dirty tactics and smears yeah. essentially and they do have a lot of money this is yeah. a fact and um, we don't talk about it enough we don't i mean part of the reason we don't talk about it enough because we don't know enough about it because it's yeah. completely opaque yeah but shimer starts infamous one million pounds 
Where did that come Where from? was it going? Where yeah. did it go? We yeah. don't know. We still don't know. They claim yeah. it was for trips for young people to yeah, yeah. Israel. Yeah. But I mean, really? that's, that's the, it's a drop <laughs> in the ocean. Yeah. You know, one million pounds when we, th when we think of across these years, yeah. what has flown in and out, you know, yeah. and there's pass through organizations. This is the truth. And they, I'm mm. sure they buy MPs. I'm yeah. sure they do. But, but, because th not all of these people, like who was Joan Ryan anyway? Yeah. And who is this guy? St what is it? Steve? I can't remember any of their names. Who is Joan Ryan's successor? I think his name's Steve Reed. Yeah. Who, yeah. who is he? No one's heard of him. Yeah. But here's the question then, Asan, is um, how does that lead us into your latest scoop, which is Gary Lubner? Yeah, so the the one of the big cleavages within the Corbyn years and one of the potentials for change that we saw that you talked about at the beginning was that, you know, one of the things that was changed, that did briefly change in the Labour Party was the potential to involve a mass movement of people, you know, for good, for, for some sort of positive change in the country. And one of the ways that that would have been done, and that did start to happen to an extent, was to remove the corporate lobbying money from politics and to replace it with people, with people power. And, you know, Jeremy Corbyn ultimately left the Labour Party in very good financial shape. Um, and that was because um, it, it was supported by a mass movement of members, which, which was nearing 600,000 people at its height. You know, it was um, reaching record levels in the Labour Party. You know, under Tony Blair, the Labour Party became this corporate husk, which was financed by major corporate donors, essentially. Uh, the leading light of which, of course, was Michael Levy, infamously known as Lord Cashpoint, um, because he was he was himself a donor um, to uh, Tony Blair's neoliberal Labour Party. But more importantly, he rallied other big, businessmen, big uh, businessmen to support labor, uh, new labor, the new labor project. Um, and he was, uh, he was a very influential uh, Israel lobbyist. And so, you know, that all fed the direction of neoliberal pro-war, pro-Israel labor under Tony Blair. And the Corbyn years, that started to change because just the very fact that Corbyn was in charge of it meant all these big donors started pulling out and some of them actually had made loans which was really interesting they'd made loans to the labor party well they started to call those loans in when corbyn came <laughs> in and they were all making a big fuss about oh we're gonna we're not gonna donate any more and you know corbyn just said okay good <laughs> <laughs> you know so that was good but the problem of course now is that two hundred thousand people who joined the labor party to vote for corbyn have now been kicked out, essentially kicked out or pushed out of the Labour Party in some way by the purges of the membership that have happened under Keir Starmer. Uh, and that really, let's be honest, began in the Corbyn years. Um, now, you know, as especially targeting the pro-Palestinian left, Palestine solidarity activists and so forth. Now, those 200,000 people have also taken their membership fees with them. So this was what was replacing the corporate donors was just small, small donors, individual people giving their monthly uh, whatever it was, five or six pounds or whatever it was. Um, and, and then at election time rallying around, putting in 20 pounds, whatever it, it needed. And that was incredibly successful. You know, it was never talked about by the, and, you know, we saw similar things happen with other insurgent campaigns like Bernie Sanders and so forth. That people power is now gone, and it's, we're bringing we're, the Blairites are back in, and so Keir Starmer is looking for big donors again, and he's bringing them back in. And it was announced earlier this month by the Financial Times, which basically did a puff piece interview with this guy, that one of these big donors, and potentially the, the biggest one, is going to be a man called Gary Lubner. Now, Gary Lubner, you know, I read the article; it didn't say. He didn't say that he was an Israel lobbyist, but I thought, yeah, let me look the guy up. I bet he is. And sure, lo and behold, he is an active donor and financier of the Israel lobby in this country. And, you know, no doubt all over the world. Um, he's certainly a long term uh, funder of the UJIA, which is um, very the United Jewish Israel Appeal, which um, sends young people, mostly Jewish young people on trips 
to it, propaganda trips to Israel to basically indoctrinate them into Zionism. And it's Where they've been found to stay in illegal settlements. In illegal settlements as well. Um, so this, this um, is, and it's actually very closely tied to the state of Israel itself. So he's a long-term supporter of that. But what was also interesting in this story was that what I found was that Gary Ludner is a South African. So, but he, he's lived in this country for uh, a good number of years now. Um, since he um, began working, um, well, rewind the story a bit. The interesting part is he he was a South African. He is a South African. He um, is uh, basically the scion of a very rich family, a very rich white South African family, um, which ran a company, a family firm, which was later, you know, at certain points was worth billions um, and was doing billions in sales. It was it started off as a, a plate glass firm, a windshields firm. And actually, the company now still owns the brand in Britain. It owns brands all over the world, but the most famous brand in Britain is Autoglass, which, you know, you, if your windscreen gets broken by, uh, by damage or thief or whatever, you, you get your windscreen replaced. Well, this company started in South Africa, and it made uh, it made a, a huge amount of money. Expanded into construction and uh, and all kinds of uh, areas. It was known as the PG Group. Uh, and Gary Lubner later started was later in charge as CEO of Belron, its international arm, which acquired all these brand names all over the world or started them. I'm not sure of all the details, um, <clears throat> including Autoglass. Now, PG Group was a, and this was uh, something that I was informed about by uh, Andrew Feinstein, former uh, ANC MP in South Africa, you know, would be familiar to lots of views of your podcast. He told me that the Lubners, the Lubner family were very well known in South Africa as sanctions busters during the South African apartheid regime. And it was really interesting what I found out on it. So, it, and this is not just, this is not a case of blaming the son for the sins of the fathers. That's, that's not, that's not what it was. So the company, PG Group, was owned and run by uh, Ronnie Lubner, who was Gary Lubner's father, and also his brother, um, <clears throat> Bertie Lubner, so Gary Lubner's uncle. It, yes, okay, they're relatives, but that it was a family firm. And Gary Lubner went into the family business. He became an accountant, and through the 80s, through this sanctions-busting period, he was an accountant for the firm, and he later went on to run. He went led to as I mentioned, later went went on to run the CEO. Of course, later now in the post-apartheid era, he's claiming that he was the like a lot of white South Africans. Um, he, he you know claims to have been against apartheid. Well, the fact is that you know something like ninety percent of white South Africans voted in favour of apartheid. So. You know, these kinds of claims, false claims of, oh, I was against it all along, are quite common, unfortunately. But the fact is, he he made his millions off a company that played an active role in supporting the South African apartheid regime's white supremacist regime. So, for example, Bertie and Ronnie Lubner, they actually donated, they personally donated to the ruling National Party, um, to the Prime Minister in the early 80s, P.W. Bolter, who, let's not forget, was uh, <clears throat> at one point in the 1940s was involved in the South African Nazi group, an explicitly pro-Hitler organization. He later left it, but he was a white supremacist his whole life. There's no doubt about that. And he, went, he ran a very viciously um, white supremacist, uh, racist regime um, at, at a time when there was just a, a, a really brutal uh, regime in South Africa. Uh, a, a military dictatorship and it, it essentially claimed to be a democracy, but it wasn't um, quite similar to apartheid Israel in, in a lot of ways. Um, and so this, and, and also Ronnie and Bertie Lubner, they also offered $15 million to start a lobby group, a pro-apartheid lobby group in Washington, D.C., on behalf of the regime, and this was all. This all came out later. It only came out a few. It only came about out about five or six years ago in South Africa, but very well reported in South Africa, and it's all there to see. Um, and so it's quite fitting in a way that this man would be funding the Labour Party in Britain of of today, because the leader of the Labour Party today has made it clear that his only issue that he's really 
passionate about is supporting apartheid Israel. He has called himself a supporter of Zionism without qualification. That was his pitch when he was running. That was his pitch to the Israel lobby when he was running for leader of the Labour Party. And so it is Keir Starmer who has made this um, his kind of emblematic issue. And Gary Lubner did an interview with the, the Puff Peace interview with the, well, it was basically a press release for Gary Lubner in the Financial Times. And he, you know, he was claiming in the article, oh, under Corbyn, it, there was all this anti-Semitism in the party and my youngest son was attacked with it. And it's great that Keir Starmer has thrown them all out to his credit. So the point is now is to secure the Labour Party for the future, for the corporate interests, for the Israel lobby, um, and to ensure that nothing like Corbynism can ever, ever happen again in the Labour Party and that the status quo is maintained indefinitely. And that is a fantastic way to wrap us up today. We are unfortunately out of time. Thank you so much, Asa. Um, I recommend everybody pick up the book now if you can. What's its latest position on Amazon? Oh, yeah, I was just checking the Amazon charts, Amazon UK charts on the way over, and it was at um, number 400 and something. So In the entire world? In, in on Amazon UK. So Right. You know, it's 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 a modest position, but it's outselling at some other people, and uh, it's currently outselling David Baddiel. You know, look, <laughs> it's it's a chart position; it can change. Yeah. Look, I don't have the institute. It's a small radical publisher. I don't have the institutional support. I've had no mainstream media coverage, and I think the book is doing well. And you know, I want to thank all everyone who's bought it because there is a lot of goodwill for the book, and people want to read the book, and they they're glad to just really, I think read what happened yeah you know people are still kind of in shell shock about what happened yeah, because yeah it was yeah. so massive yeah, yeah. and they're glad to just kind of be vindicated of yeah this did actually happen i'm not exactly going, i'm not going nuts. exactly you exactly. know this is all documented yeah, yeah so yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely thank you so much for joining us asa thank you to the crew for making this happen today um please Join us next time on Mint Press. And by the way, we have a, uh, a funding drive um, about to be launched. We hope that you can support us. You know, we are an independent media organization at a time where we are conspired against by different uh, structures of power that we study they work to get us deplatformed from paypal um, and from other places too so for us to keep doing this kind of journalism and to keep exposing those lobby groups and uh, aspects of the military industrial complex we need your support for us to cover the stories that affect you in your life we need your support. So we hope that after viewing this fantastic episode with Asa to support us and people like Asa, you can donate to Mint Press as part of the new Funder Drive. Thank you so much for joining us on The Watchdog. Thank you, Asa. I appreciate you coming.